All right, so Google has dropped their first natively multimodal in and out image generator. This means we're talking about a visual language model that can not only respond in text, but in images too. In other words, the era of conversational editing is here. Simply describe what you want to do to an image and it will do it for you. Now, I've been on the early access program for a couple months now, and I wanna show you all the cool things that you can do with it. But by far, the most exciting thing to me is the fact that you can take what was otherwise like complex effects authoring and turn that into a single text prompt. Like doing an effect like this is a comfy UI workflow. Same thing with something like this. And now that multi-node comfy UI workflow is collapsed down to a freaking text prompt, absolutely wild. I think developers and creators alike are gonna do amazing things with it. So let's get into all the cool stuff that you can do right now. So first off, it's awesome that you've got a chat that can natively generate images in line with text. So in this example, I asked about UAPs. Everyone's talking about Egypt and freaking pyramids and UFOs these days. So I basically said, hey, can you please break down the different types of UAP sightings. Very simple prompt, and I got a bunch of answers. And I basically just said, help me visualize the major kinds. And suddenly I got very thoughtful answers. I've got the classic disc-shaped UFO. We've got the orb-like UFOs that are commonly reported. You've got the cigar-shaped ones, the triangle ones. But take a look at this Tic Tac UFO example. Long, white, smooth, cylindrical object, no visible wings or markings, blurred against the blue sky as if moving incredibly fast in a long exposure photo. And you can see it really does look like a long exposure photo. Even underwater UAPs, like the depiction is absolutely fantastic. What's cool about this is that these models are really able to lean on their world understanding, meaning when it's generating images, it's not simply leveraging the corpus of imagery in its training data. These models can pull from the entirety of their world understanding, which includes clearly a lot of text data about different kinds of UAPs, the kinds of sightings, and sort of very intricate details within them. So this is pretty cool, right? If you're trying to understand subject matter, it's like you're getting an illustrated chapter back for your specific query. Super, super powerful and very, very cool. Now, of course, the model is also very good at editing existing images that you upload. So to give you a very simple example, just colorizing black and white photos. Here's a 1928 shot of the San Francisco Ferry Building, and you can see it gave it a very nice, like, painterly aesthetic. Here's another retro shot of San Francisco that looks pretty good, and then the OG Abraham Lincoln himself. And I've been pretty impressed with the results. Now, if you don't get the result right out the gate, uh, just reroll the prompts, like you're used to this. And so the way you do that is actually clicking this button right over here, rerun this turn. You can also edit it slightly and rerun it if you want. Now, what you can also do is essentially chain together different edits, right? Conversational editing, if you will. So for example, in this photo of myself, I'm basically saying, hey, like keep the subject, but change the background to a space station with a massive window overlooking earth, boom. Done. Like, all right, well, it looked like you just did like a chroma key and a swap. So like, why don't you change the overall lighting to look uh, consistent and cinematically eye-catching? And as you'll notice with every subsequent iteration, as I add this like spaceship in the background, I add, as I add the text in, you can notice my likeness is degrading oh so slightly. So this is one of the limitations of this experimental model right now is, is that you will lose some of the detail and likeness of your characters or objects or whatever entities that you you care about with every subsequent iteration. It's also really good at creating filters, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So since we are talking about the first model that can combine multimodal inputs, enhanced reasoning, and natural language to create images, it's of course really good at text rendition. So if you say, hey, generate a photorealistic photo of a chalkboard and then define what exactly you want to write in, in inverted commas, you're gonna get a great result. And I've actually been very impressed with this. Now, of course, to the initiated, this is actually an inside joke because GPT-40 shows showcased this exact functionality, natively multimodal image generation in May of 2024. <sighs> and this was the whole point, right? Like that text generation was just so good that you could ask it to write down like on a whiteboard, a very long sentence and it would do the rendition perfectly. Turns out Google beat them to the punch. And honestly, this thing's been in early access since like October last year. What's especially cool about this is like, you can do all sorts of image generation. like. 
We've talked about AI Studio in the past, since this is like technically a developer tool, you can turn down a bunch of these safety settings, meaning you can do image generations like this one with Elon over here, turning this into like a flamethrower and swapping the character in the background with a stormtrooper. Works beautifully. And what's cool is like, yes, you could have done this, but this would have been a bunch of prompting in Photoshop, right? Let's say with something like generative fill and probably wouldn't have been like, oh, I can't do fire for you or certainly wouldn't have done the stormtrooper in the backdrop. So I think the meme potential for this is exceedingly high. Now, at least for the first image itself, you'll also notice that the character consistency is very good. So let's say you provide a selfie like this and you're basically like, hey, put me in a completely different background and you're trying to manufacture some excuse to get out of work. It works exceedingly well, including placing the date on the LED monitor up top here. Very, very cool stuff. I can also see some amazing use cases for interior design. Let's say you're trying to figure out how to redecorate your space. You just type in a prompt, like make the furniture go away and boom, gone. It infills everything for you. And then you ask it to swap in something with a modern chic aesthetic. And this is cool, right? Because again, it can pull on its world knowledge beyond just the caption images that it's seen with a modern chic aesthetic. It has a good idea of what constitutes that style. And I think where things get really interesting is if you start creating more complex text prompts that do a bunch of operations on the images just in one shot. And so here's a great example. Add a glitch VHS retro wave filter to this image with a background completely in ASCII art and the person in this sort of like green and blue wireframe. And I got a pretty cool result. Same thing over here, make the character look like a Minecraft 3D character keep the background the same, but add some bokeh to it and darken it slightly. And you can notice it did add this bokeh in the background. It has some nice grain to it too, and I can see the bokeh very nicely rolling off with the subject right over here itself. Now it didn't darken it exactly, but holy crap, it did everything else. Now what's cool about all of this stuff is suddenly all of the technical barriers are gone, right? Like reproducing something like these effects would have been this like complex, comfy UI graph. And now it's just collapsed down to a freaking text prompt. It's absolutely wild, not just for us as creators, but also developers that can very easily integrate this sort of Photoshop-like editing capability into their applications. It's really, really wild. So I took the same character prompt and tried it with like a Roblox character, it looked great, Lego works beautifully too, and so does Minecraft. And if you don't get these type of results immediately, again, just re-roll a couple of times. You know the drill, this is just like, there is still sort of this like stochastic nature to generative AI, and I still think this is like fricking mind blowing despite all of that. And so Mad Pencil actually had a really great example here just to illustrate like what I mean by taking a multi-step workflow and collapsing that down to a single text prompt. So in this case, let's say you wanted to repose a character. Now, Puppet Warp is a very, very fun tool if you haven't played with it in Photoshop or After Effects. You do a little bit of generative fill, you clear out the background, you isolate the layer, and then you go into this Puppet Warp uh, mode and you basically manually repose the character. Or you could just say, make the girl stand in a straight posture and you get the same freaking result, right? So for example, if I just take a photo of myself as I make the subject stand with crossed arms, boom, done. Likeness perfectly retained, shirt changes, everything works beautifully. I didn't have to go, even with generative tools inside of let's say something like Photoshop, I'd gone in and done a generative fill. I don't think this would have looked as good and the rest of the image wouldn't have just like contextually been modified to produce a very believable result. So I've been very, very impressed with this tool. I can imagine this be very useful for thumbnail creation, or even if you go through an extra upscaling step let for character consistency to run through like other image to video tools, you could absolutely use this to repose your character and then run it through your usual Pika, Runway, uh, Kling, whatever workflow you use for image to video. Now, one of the things I've been really blown away by in playing with this model is effectively the spatial understanding that it has. So just to illustrate this, I'm gonna say, turn this subject into a 3D model and show their side profile and get a load of the results. Kind of mind bogglingly good. Like, especially if I look at this right now, you've got, you've got the ground truth right here. Look, oh my God, this is really cool, right? But you can actually take this a step further. So I took this shot of me co-presenting a session with the one and only Chris Anderson last year at TED and basically said, turn this into a fricking 3D wireframe representation of every unique object and subject in the scene and it should look like a Blender 3D viewport with the wireframe mode turned on. And this is what I got. This actually looks more like a Maya viewport, <laughs> uh, specifically viewport 2.0 for the initiated. And you can see like, it's kind of wild how good 
the spatial understanding is like it got the Ted logo, the person even sitting here, barely visible in the front. It got the speaker. It's even got the lectern over here. Very, very nicely done. And just, yeah, even the geometry for us looks really, really good. And it's isolated the different clothing. Same thing here with a shot of the golden temple. And you can see it does a phenomenal job of reproducing these results. Now, of course, this isn't new, but to do stuff like this, historically, we've had to use control net, which are using all these task specific models for things like depth estimation, edge detection, and then you kind of put them all together uh, to create a result like this. And obviously people love the results, but the thing is, these were task specific models. Gemini is somehow figuring this out implicitly, and that makes it really, really wild in my opinion. So here's just another example I wanted to showcase on Oscar, just so you have an example of like a completely different face type. Turn him into a 3D model viewed from the side, and you can just see how good this looks, right? Absolutely wild. Like I can't, I can't even imagine when this model can do video out, how good the results might be. And by the way, this is something the system is capable of. They just haven't exposed it to us yet. Now, Amira inspired by this post of mine did a really cool example here that just shows you how slick these results can be. Absolutely phenomenal. It's got the pocket detail. Oh, just the topology looks like surprisingly good and detailed for what we are seeing over here. But holy crap, without control net, just natively one shots these things. I wonder how many other emergent capabilities we'll see from these different types of models. Now, another cool thing you can do is add props in a semantically aware fashion. Now, without needing a control net to basically tell you, hey, yeah, like the lips are over here, the eyes are over here, or some sort of mask that you might use to specify that, you can literally take a generation of Snoop Dogg in this case and be like, place a lit blunt in the subject's mouth and make them wear real life pixel art sunglasses, you get some amazing results. Now what's powerful about this is like nothing in this was specific to this image. I can do the exact same thing for myself as well. And you get great results. Now imagine how powerful this is as a creator or as a developer. Let's say you want to add this new functionality where somebody can upload their image and up up upload an image of a person and you get this sort of output. Now historically to do something like this, you might use something like MediaPipe if you're using like like augmented reality, or you might be using a certain type of control net inside a comfy UI. And basically, again, creating this multi-step workflow that's all been collapsed down into a single text prompt. So if you're a developer or a creator that's creating this workflow, you just run this prompt again and again and do it and do it at scale. Super, super powerful. I, I think there's a ton of meme potential here. I want to take that classic vibe coding example, be like, please infer my next prompt and respond accordingly. Boom. You get some great results. I guess this is the future of prompting, huh? Here's another one I tried where I basically said, keep me in the image, but put me inside this like wireframe 3D simulation and make it all look cinematic and realistic. And it just did a great job. It changed the camera angle slightly. It's like the camera's moved up looking down but it's got the chain, it got my hoodie, uh, it got the hands, and again, it looks like I'm inside of a 3D software. This is gonna be so much fun to create thumbnails, and here's another one where I was trying other things, like can it look like a LiDAR point cloud? Um, and so LiDAR point clouds have obviously this like blotchy point-like quality to it. Usually you have this kind of false color representation. <laughs> it's, it created a pretty cool result. The the speckle patterns on me look a little bit more like a face ID when it's like uh, projecting that af active depth pattern on you, but still very, very cool stuff. Speaking of memes, I mean, you wanna do like glowing red crypto eyes, just say add red glowing eyes, right? Like it's kind of wild. Um, you can have yourself like zapping, shooting out lasers. It looks just really, really fun. Now what this model is also very good at is in painting. So here I said, zoom out to reveal three gray aliens standing on the right side of the hallway, raising their arms to gesture they come in peace. Pretty freaking cool result and really good consistency. Changing camera angles, it's really good at two. Just like we were trying to rotate the subject matter like of the person, you can change the camera angle quite well too using this tool. Now I will say if you don't wanna have like too much text in the image itself, and you're cool with just like a couple of words, I still find ideogram to be the more solid choice. So if I just wanted to, let's say, add my name and then just like a little byline, I think you'll get better results with ideogram and the image fidelity is better. But if you've got more than a couple of words, at least right now, there is another ideogram model coming out. Uh, for now though, with a model that's publicly available, Gemini's your Gemini's the king for long, long form text. It's just absolutely amazing. Now, some of the other cool examples I found is people doing sprite sheets for different types of games that they're making. Hey, like you create like a map and then you say, hey, like, can you actually split this into all the various components for a sprite sheet? And just like the UFO example I showed you, when you ask these models to reason about stuff before they generate the images, for example, tell me about the different types of UAPs before it created those images, it'll do these tasks better too.
So consider loading some of these things into context, flushing out text responses, like to give a background context on what it is that you intend to generate and then have it do that task. Another example that I really enjoyed by Parl over here was basically just creating keyframes for animation. For example, in this case, like a cricketer going through the motion of hitting a ball. You can imagine yourself doing exactly this with like a start and end keyframe, let's say having your character walk from one end of the scene to the other end of the scene. It is thus no surprise that are a bunch of applications people are making, indie hacks. So, um, and you can make some very simple apps, right? Like using vibe coding, which we've talked about in previous videos. So for example, this is the shape of a universal image editing pipeline. And I just hit generate and boom, you'll get amazing, amazing results very, very quickly. And notice how it's contextual too. It's like, it's making, making it seem like a pipeline, like a bunch of chips that are overlaid on top of each other. Very, very cool. And where this can get really powerful is you combine it with all the other image editing capabilities you have access to. Like if I was Adobe, and Adobe, if you are listening to this, because I know you watch my videos, you've got to integrate this. You've got the research team. You've got the chops to make this happen. You better ship quickly because you know what's happening otherwise. The likes of FreePake have already integrated this, right? And so if you want to do things like, hey, add a gradient background, add a shadow, all these things that you might have done inside of Photoshop, you can do them in free pick. You can do them for free inside of Google AI Studio. And by the way, this is just an experimental model. This is the worst that it'll ever be. It's only gonna get better from here. And I hear the team's already working on making that like degradation that happens between iteration a lot better. And they actually rolled out a fix just earlier this week that already makes it a lot better. All right, so another cool example is if you go to hackyexperiments.com, you can check this one out. What I love about this, it just gives you an example of how they're abstracting of the prompting from the user too. It's like, I say I want this like a professional headshot, let's say uh, male, and I want like a office environment and I click enhance photo. Just a single photo that I've dropped in, I've made a couple of different options and let's see what kind of result we get. Pretty freaking amazing, right? And let's say industry expert, neutral gray background. <laughs> I mean, not bad at all, not bad at all. So you can imagine this being really fun, right? Like how you look like tatted up, easy. How you look slimmed down, easy. Wanna try different hairstyles, easy. Wanna edit out your X, super easy. I mean, don't just remove watermarks, remove your X's, y'all. Oh, so good. So to wrap things up, let's talk about how this is headed towards video. So of course we've talked about, um, generating keyframes. So you get your character in different positions. You can create essentially this flipbook style, you know, keyframes and use like your start and end keyframe in whatever video model you're using these days. What you can also do is take advantage of reskinning existing videos using the new restyle video feature inside of Runway. So here I've got like a very simple video shot uh, right outside San Francisco. So I took that first frame and then I brought it into to AI Studio to essentially restyle it, add this like radioactive signage, put a bunch of destruction on the ground, and then I use that as the first reference and voila, I got some really cool results. Like these are actually really, really good results for what I'm trying to do. Essentially like a matte painting or a set extension or something like that. And you could go totally wild with it. I mean, here I really tried changing the lighting conditions and all this other stuff, so much potential. But of course where all this stuff is going is not just image out, but video out too. So you could provide, let's say text instructions of video itself, and then the model gives you the final output. If you've ever seen these visualizations, that's why Gemini does this. This is supposed to denote multimodal in, multimodal data, text, image, video, et cetera, going in, but also coming out. And something that gives us a very nice flavor of what this is gonna look like is Pika sneak peek. They haven't released this, but essentially exactly what I just told you, where I type in a text prompt and I can basically modify existing video directly. And I think this is gonna be super, super powerful for a lot of different use cases. But certainly for me, oh my God, I'm feeling jealous. Like this was a whole last day in Adobe After Effects, shooting a clean plate or doing some sort of infilling. And now it's just a friggin' text prompt. Absolutely wild. Again, kids just don't know how good they have it these days. And amidst all of that, don't lose your excitement about these things. It is very easy to get jaded. Oh, cool new thing coming out, etc. But don't lose that childlike wonder, that spark for excitement to explore and play with these tools. Mazer has exactly the right idea. You wanna go create that Hadouken VFX. In fact, you could go and freaking do it. All right, so that is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have fun with AI Studio. And if you haven't seen the previous video already where we talked about all the other cool vibe Cody things that you can do inside of AI Studio and other tools like Claude, definitely check that video out. And I will see y'all in the next one.